praise him this morning.
They heard of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some had witnessed, witnessed it. But they're all gathered in a room together. And then all of a sudden, from nowhere, Jesus appeared in the room with them. I believe that same Jesus is here this morning. Because he said, when you gather together in my name, and we came this morning in Jesus' name, right? We gather in his name. He's here with us here now. And we anticipate the morning or the day that we gather around the throne, every nation, tribe, and tongue, gathering around the throne of God, singing, holy, 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 holy. What about today? What about now?
so we invited them to come to prayer meeting, and uh, we had a prayer meeting yesterday morning. And uh, if you were not here, then uh, I'm so sorry you missed it. But some of those teachers yesterday told us that we'll be back for prayer meeting. Uh, it was just a good, special time. And, and then we went up there, and we cut trees, and we tore down gazebo, and we cut trees, and we tore down gazebo, and we, we kept cutting trees, and we kept working there. And I'll tell you, most of us are tired and worn out. Uh, today, uh, I went to bed last night. Yesterday at about 5.30. Of course, I've been up since 1.30 a.m., so uh, it was about time for that. But, but some of these guys and girls uh, were worn out. I don't see how that they uh, made it through the day. But some of them told me they went home and worked even more. Not this one. Um, but uh, anyway, we had a good time. And invite you next Saturday to come and pray with us at 9 o'clock. We're not going to work at Crestwood after that. So... But you're welcome to come and pray with us. We'd love to have you here. Uh, let me remind you that we do, well, let me just say, we do need more people, uh, some people to help us at Crestwood, but in a different way this time. We're needing some adults to go and uh, sit with third graders and let third graders read to you, uh, kind of some mentors, uh, if you will. And uh, this would, obviously would have to be done during school time. If you want to be a part of that or are interested in uh, helping do that, then uh, let me ask you to just make sure that, make us a note on a uh, connect card, but make sure that you've got your name and phone number on there. Just let us know that you would be interested in doing that. Also, these connect cards are a good place to put your prayer needs because our prayer team would come along with you this afternoon, praying over your needs and whatever burdens you carry, we'll come along with you this afternoon and begin praying with you and praying with you throughout the week. So these cards are good for that too. Uh, the ushers will be standing at the door on your way out and you can just drop it in the back bin. They'll collect them for us. And also the offering envelopes that are there if you want to give in your tithe and offerings, uh, it can be done there as well. For those of you online, look at sharing with you the link to where you can do the online giving as well as the online connect cards. And if some of you are wanting to do that, then you are more than welcome to help us do that. We know that the third grade reading uh, test preparation is a big deal every year, so we're just trying to get a running start on this and joining with Crestwood and helping them up there in that. Let me say that on Wednesday night, we're having groups to meet again and love for you to come and be a part of that. Uh, we also uh, have Awana that is going over on the kids' side, all the way from the cradle up to 12th grade. And uh, there's a place for your child or grandchildren there, so uh, bring them on with you. And it's a good place to fellowship with adults as you sit around and uh, talk in the group. So come on and be a part of that. Breakfast at the barn on Thursdays. Now we have a growing group of people, growing this way and in number as well. So uh, we, we had a good time, and uh, it's been interesting to watch all of these new recipes on these casseroles coming in on Thursday mornings, and you're welcome to be a part of it. All you have to do is show up at uh, 8 o'clock at the barn on Thursday mornings if you are not working or uh, maybe retired, come on and join us. It's a good place just to connect, and we all have a great time there. So we invite you to come and do that as well. Let me just say that there had been some talks of a trunk or treat, uh, but because of uh, a lot of different things, we have canceled the trunk or treat. There will be some things going on for the children here. I believe either the Wednesday night before or the Sunday after. Uh, not Halloween -y type things, but candy, uh, fun, and uh, fall celebrations. So I uh, want you to have that opportunity to, uh, or let your children have that opportunity as well. So, we sang, so, and then this is one of my favorite songs that I always get hoarse because I sing it so hard, so loud, uh, Rooftops. I love that song. So I'll shout out, from the rooftops, I'll proclaim that I am yours. Does that get you going? Does that make you excited? Well, then, why don't we just tell 101? <laughs> if we're going to shout it from the rooftops, we've got
got to work up something within us to where we can just tell one on one that we're his and tell what he can do. What I'm talking about is personal evangelism. When we're singing in a group, we can all stand and sing. And I hope you weren't lying. When you said I had a shout from the rooftops, I'll proclaim. So what about personal evangelism? Personal evangelism, telling other people about Jesus Christ. So this is what we're dealing with, and uh, we've been talking about authenticity. Uh, just being real, telling your story uh, the way it is. Just, just being plain, telling people about what Jesus Christ has done in your life. Some reason or another, every time I think of the word authentic, I think of those tacos we ate on the street in Orange Walk, Belize, uh, last Thanksgiving season that we were there in Belize. The best tacos I've ever eaten in my life. And since then, we've got to come back, and Carol and I have tried to duplicate those, and different people told me where those same tacos were in town, and I've not found them yet. But that's what I think of, authentic, something real, something that I mean we're going to Belize over. And by the way, we're going back to Belize in March. If you want to be a part of the mission team, then uh, we can sign you up. If you want to go to Belize, uh, you're more than welcome to go with us, and we'd love to take you there. But then today we're dealing with personal evangelism, one-on-one. -on -one. The people that you come up uh, in contact with every day, it may be people that you're living with, people you work with, people you go to school with, your neighbors. So we're going to talk about how to tell your story. How to tell the story about Jesus Christ. And last week we talked about Saul of Tarsus who met Jesus uh, through a light that was shining so brightly that it blinded him. And he couldn't see for several days. He was never the same again. If that happened to everyone, most everyone would be as enthusiastic about Jesus Christ as Paul was. If everybody had that Damascus Road experience where Jesus all of a sudden, in a bright, blinding light, just took you down. Everybody would be believing in Jesus. Everybody would be like, oh, right? But everyone does not have that same experience. I didn't. I did not had some close encounters with the Lord before, and I mean sometimes that, that I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Lord was with me and, and the Lord working in my life. And, and um, but... Nothing quite like what Saul had. Some Christian or some people come to Christ by only just a simple invitation, right? I know Saul was hard-headed, so he got the big one. But most of us come to Christ just with a simple invitation. John Scott made a statement that the church is under orders. You understand what that means. If you're in the military or know anything about the military, you know what that means. The church is under orders. Evangelistic inactivity is disobedience. In other words, not spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ is being disobedient to our leader. What did Jesus say before he left? Go. Into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world. The first step of making a disciple is inviting them to get to know Jesus, to say to them, Come and see, right? Just, just come and see. So, telling our story, give, giving voice to our faith journey, our encounter, and the transformation by the work and the person of Jesus Christ in our life, and our longings for holiness and wholeness is the way that Christians invite people to come and see the Savior, being an open book, showing and telling the world what Jesus Christ has done in us, and it's a powerful story. Right? It's a powerful story. And if you're a believer in Christ, you have one. 
It could have been on a Sunday morning. The Holy Spirit was dealing with your heart. It could have been at a night when you were, were at home alone. Or it could have been on the road. It could have been in a hospital room. It could have been in an emergency room. When you realized that God was calling you and you said, yes, Lord, here I am. And in your life became a there became a transformation that started and then it moved. But what we must understand is that our story is not the jewel, but just the setting on which the jewel sits. Right? Our story is not the picture. Our story is the frame that frames the picture. We invite people to look into our lives and see the real presence of Jesus Christ. Right? Yes, if I told you today, and I've shared a lot of this over the past seven and a half years, but if I stood here today and told you everything that Jesus has done in my life, there would be a whole lot about me there. But what I want us to understand is what happened here was Jesus. Right? What happened here was Jesus. The real story is Jesus Christ. It's not me. It's Jesus Christ. I'm just the setting. He's the jewel. Paul tells the Romans that the power of God is the gospel. Right? The power of God is the gospel. Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I love the part that everyone is included there. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if they go to church or not. It doesn't matter if they're raised in a church family or not. It doesn't matter if they've got relatives that are saved or not. But it's everyone, everybody, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We spend millions of dollars in missions here in the United States to spread the news of Jesus Christ to people on foreign soil. But he'll also save our neighbor. I'll be glad when you catch up with me. He'll also save your neighbor. The good news must be the focus of our testimony. That good news, that gospel story, the power of God must be the focus of our testimony. A testimony that contains... Hold on, let me get there. Have you ever preached from an iPad? A testimony that contains the power of God, which is the gospel, finds its focus in the person of Jesus Christ. Not so much our personal encounter with him. Paul did not spend the rest of his life telling them about the light on the road to Damascus, but he told them about the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Look in all of his epistles and you will find over and over and over him talking about the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God. That was the story. So I've asked each of you over the past couple of weeks to write a story. Your story. Not my story, but write your story of how you came to know Jesus Christ. Have you done that? No, don't tell me, and we're not asking for turn-ins, but have you done that? Have you begun just to write your story? Because as you write your story, it helps you to think about things and how you may need to, to, to go in and change things and you forget something and you add it. But what I want you to do if you have, I want you to go back and count some words for me. How many times have you put in the word I, me, my? And then go and look at how many times you put the words Jesus, or he referring to Jesus, or him referring to Jesus. So what I'm getting at is, is your story more about you, or is it more about him? So we're building the story to which we can share with those people who do not know Jesus Christ. Just don't make it about us. Dr. Robin Castleman made a statement that what is often heard in churches, on TV, and in many Christian venues from people is often what she calls a meomony. Instead of a 
testimony, me alone. It's all about me. My, I, I just remember the song that my son used to sing, and I think it was a Toby Keith song. And it's something about all about me, all about mine, all, you know, all about, I don't know that I can't sing that song. But you know what I'm talking about? She wants to talk about her, right? You, you get the, the picture. The testimony turns into a me and and all about me. You know, and what I have now, what I've accomplished, and me. Story that talks about the goodness of God and a personal experience, but the sacred rehearsal of atonement through the cross and recreation through resurrection, the salvific work of Jesus Christ seems to be missing in a whole lot of testimonies. What do we hear when we hear a testimony? When somebody that is an unchurched, unbeliever, non-Christian hears your testimony, what are they hearing? A, a really good story about you? Or are they hearing the power of Jesus Christ, the power of transformation in your life? Did you know that other than forgiveness and eternal life, the gospel really makes no other guarantees? You got your seatbelt on, right? You got your seatbelt on. You ready? Other than forgiveness and eternal life, the gospel of Jesus Christ makes no other guarantees. Although modern day Christianity, we've tried to make some, right? But we can't guarantee that a person that surrenders their life to Christ will have a faithful spouse. guarantee that they'll have healthy children. We cannot guarantee that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sins are forgiven and you have eternal life, and then you'll have a cure for your disease. Or a cure for COVID. Right? We cannot promise that once you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, that you will have nothing but restful nights of Plenty of sleep. If so, I missed it. I have a horrible time trying to sleep. Yesterday morning was 1.30. I was wide awake, so I worked on the sermon from 1.30 until almost time to go to the prayer meeting. No, but the gospel of Jesus Christ guarantees forgiveness. For whatever sin has been committed, whatever wrong has been done, it guarantees forgiveness. It guarantees eternal life, right? Whoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. Don't you remember that part? It guarantees salvation from sin. It guarantees eternal life. If the story of my life is not bound up in the importance of the Christ story, then I am bound to either misrepresent the gospel or misdirect the speaker or, or the seeker, rather. If I do not center my story of salvation around Jesus Christ and the power of transformation, the power of Jesus Christ working in me, then I have an opportunity to misrepresent the gospel or to misdirect the secret. So many people want to jump on board Christianity because... Obviously, of what we've known from the years past of the name and acclaimed movement, movement, right? Where you just put your hands on the Cadillac and say, his name is mine, and drive off with it, right? That works for about 30 days. Uh, but, but then they come looking for it, right? Okay? Or, so, so you know, you know the story. The, the gospel salvation doesn't guarantee that. The gospel salvation, uh, the gospel message guarantees that you will be forgiven of your sins. I'm concerned, and I thought about this a lot this morning, I'm concerned about a lot of the posts that we put on social media. Because if people see it who are not Christians, are they taking the message that, okay, then everything is hunky dory and, and, and we can go one or two ways here, because when we post things as Christians, does that make them think everything is going to be hunky dory if I accept Jesus Christ? He says, the Lord is saved, you're my life. And I'm looking down, I'm on vacation. Or, or look at them. Also, 
post on social media how bad it is? Do they get the wrong impression by our post on social media saying how bad life is by being a Christian? <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. No matter how bad your life is, if your sins are forgiven, if you have eternal life, you're better off than you ever wanted to be in the first place, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that everything you've done has been forgiven, erased. Right? So, with our story, what should we do? The first thing is simplify. Let's just make it simple. Let's just simplify. Give a clear presentation of the gospel with a framework of our faith story. Simplify it. We do not have to stand on the sidewalk and give somebody a 30 minute sermon about the power of Jesus Christ being able to transform a life, but just give them a clear presentation. Carol figured out a way to deal, give a clear, simple presentation yesterday. Uh, Noel has been with us all weekend, and we uh, went and got pizza Friday night. And ironically, she got one that's gluten-free. Noel got one that uh, only had cheese on it, and then I had to get one uh, that I didn't want gluten-free, and I didn't want one with just cheese. So anyway, long story. Carol's got this gluten-free pizza she told me yesterday. Because we ate leftovers last night. That many believes in leftovers, right? Okay. So last night we ate leftovers, and I told I told them because because I think dollars. I said so. The meal last night actually only cost us half of what I thought it did. Because we're spreading it on to the night, right? So we okay. You, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, we're sitting there eating pizza, and Carol says, "I want you to try this gluten-free pizza." That sounds so. Oh, here, you want to try the group of, and I, you know, I'm good. I'm, I'm eating uh, chicken taco pizza. And uh, some of you stumbled through our already. But I, I was eating chicken taco pizza. And uh, she says, I want you to try this pizza. And I'm like, mm, I'm like, mm, yeah. So she comes around to the stove and she's, She's to my right, and I'm I'm watching the, the news or weather or something on TV, and, and I'm eating the pizza, and Noel is talking, and all of a sudden, Carol calls my name, and I turn my head to look, and the pizza goes in my mouth. <laughs> that was simple, right? It, it, it was no convincing, it's just here it is. And then it tastes okay, I live through it. Um, so I want you to look at a simple message of invitation. John chapter 1, verse 40. Let me lay the foundation for you just a second. John the Baptist has told the people, his followers, that Jesus Christ, this man Jesus, is the Son of God. And he says, the way I know it is because the, the Lord has shown me that he that the Spirit descends upon when I baptize him, that will be the one. And John said, I saw when he come out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and, and God said from heaven, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. John said, this is him. So, one of those, in verse 40 of John 1, one of the two who heard John, John the Baptist speak, and followed Jesus after hearing John say that, his name was Andrew. This, and we tried this in the first service, and not the one person knew this. Have you ever sang this song, Peter and James and John went fishing? One, two. Peter and James and John went fishing. All right, Peter and James and John went fishing. Peter and James and John went fishing. Peter and James and John went fishing. Out of the Negro Sea. Did you know that that's not the right way to sing that song? Because we're leaving out Andrew. It is Peter and Drew, James and John. Instead of Peter and James and John. Peter and Drew. James and John were fishing. So this is him right here. And he followed Jesus, one who heard John and followed Jesus. His name was Andrew. And he was Simon Peter's brother. That's probably why we don't know much about Andrew, because we know a whole lot about Peter. So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, verse 41, found his own brother, Simon, who we know as Peter, and he said to him, I, I don't believe he said, hey, dude, we found Simon. 
I believe he said, hey, come, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ in John and that in parentheses. He said, but we have found the Messiah. That's it. We have found the Messiah. What are you talking about? We had been looking for the Messiah for years and years and years. And under Roman rule, we've been praying for the Messiah to come. Do you know what Andrew is saying? We have found the promise of the prophets. We have found the prophets, uh, the promise. We have found hope. You get it? This is what Andrew is saying. We have found the Messiah. We found our liberator. <coughs> Andrew's simple invitation to his brother, and usually witnessing within one's family is always much more difficult than those who do not know us so well, right? But his simple invitation to his brother was, come and see. Let's see. We found the Messiah. I can imagine his enthusiasm. Someone has said, if you give a man a dollar, you'll cheer his heart. If you give a man a dream, you'll challenge his heart. If you give him Christ, you'll change his heart. What better way to change the heart of your brother? Your own family member, right? And some of you, has anybody got family members here you'd really like to change? Amen? You got those? How many has got neighbors that you'd really like to change? How many runs into people or works with people and you see people every day that you would love to change? Give a man Christ. you will change his heart. What does it matter? Say, come and experience this that I'm talking about. And when I say come, I don't necessarily mean come to church. That's what we tend to do, right? Why don't you come go to church with me? That's that's okay. But what about saying, why don't you, why don't you come and get to know this Jesus? Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with building an altar right where you are in the middle of the street. Well, we go to the side. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with building an altar at school, at work, at home, wherever. When you want to lead someone to know Jesus Christ, just simply say, hey, we found the source, we found the hope, we found help, we found life, we found forgiveness, we found life that goes on forever. It changes heart. Today is still the invitation. We invite spiritually hungry people to take a close look at our lives. And what I've said so many times before, if you don't have a story, if you don't have a testimony, then you need to get on your face before God and get one. If your life has not been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, then by all means, get started on it now. Develop you a prayer time. Get started praying here this morning. But develop you a prayer time. Develop you a Bible reading time. Develop you a time to get along with God and just hear God speak to your heart. He will talk to you. He created you. He knows you. And he knows how to communicate with you better than your spouse does or your friend does. He knows how to communicate with you, so get where you can listen to what he says. But we invite people to take a closer look at our lives. Hear our story of transformation. Tell them how he took that old heart and turned it, that old stony heart, into a, a heart just filled with love. Yes. <clears throat> invite him to come and see who Jesus is and what he can do. Invite him to experience Jesus. Perhaps let them see it more than they hear it. Oswald Chambers says, For one man who can introduce another to Jesus Christ by the way he lives, and by the atmosphere of his life, there are a thousand who can only talk jargon about him. But they're looking at us. They're watching us. What kind of message are we sending out? What kind of invitation are we sending out with our life, with our attitude? You say, Pastor, why is this important? Well, one of the main reasons is, obviously, we're under orders to do this. As I said earlier, we have been given a great commission. And another reason, if, if you find something good, you need to share it. And if you wait and find a way out of, of hell, you need to share that way, right? 
So, but another reason they tell us that we're living in a post-Christian era, that hurts my heart. That hurts my heart. To know that the United States of America, one nation under God, indivisible, is being considered no longer a Christian nation. It disturbs me when I read them say, uh, where they say that right now, three-fourths of the United States of America consider themselves Christian, and that's all denominations, but consider themselves Christians. But within the next few years, they're expecting that number to decline, so to instead of three-fourths of the nation, only two-thirds of the nation will be classified as Christians. And uh, they're predicting that within the next few years that Islam will be one of the fastest growing uh, religions and will be right up there with Christianity as far as the millions in number. That disturbs me for several reasons. One, I know that their God's not God. And I know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I know our God is on the throne. And I know as we sang this morning, there will come a day that we'll, we'll all gather around and worship Him. And I don't want half the world or even a, a portion of the world to be left out. Because I know where they go if they don't go up. This microphone is on, right? Okay. I said I know where they go if they don't go up. And I certainly don't want them to go there. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what language they speak. I don't care how bad they are. I don't care how hateful they are. I don't care what they do. I still don't want them to go to hell. Yesterday morning, I walked in Dollar General before coming to the church. I walked in Dollar General up there near us, up on uh, whatever that is, up by the point. And I, I'm going to load up with water to bring water for the day yesterday and just have here at the church. And I walk in and I ask the girl, the, the woman, I said, where are your buckets? And the manager said, we only got one. And I look at her, <laughs> like, Dollar General only got one yellow bucket. Of all, there's no buckets. And she said, I'll run and get it for you. And the manager runs out the door, runs around the side of the building, and comes back wishing the bucket. And I said, where are your buckets? She said, they stole every one of them. So I got on this tangent about people stealing buggies because last Sunday morning I was in the front parking lot here picking up trash about daylight and I saw a lady steal one from dirt sheet. They go down the road with the buggy. But I'm gonna tell you what, I don't even want buggy stealers to go to hell. As mad as that made me yesterday, I don't want buggy stealers to go to hell. There are people who do not like me. I know you can't believe that, but there are people who do not like me. I don't want them to go to hell. And I am completely convinced that people who do not believe in Jesus Christ, who do not give their life to Jesus Christ, and let me, let me back up, and, and I'm trying to get out of here before supper, but let me tell you this. I believe it's more than signing a membership card. I believe it is a life change that has to happen. So just to say that I believe in Jesus Christ, that doesn't get it. But allow him to transform your life, that's what it is. And I believe if we don't do that, I believe that there's bad news ahead. We have got to tell people what Jesus has done. But sometimes we use such churchy language that people don't understand what we're talking about. Walk up to somebody and talk about redemption, salvation, asking Jesus to come in your life, atonement, justification, all that kind of stuff, and they're like, huh? You know, they don't have a clue what we're talking about. What, what do we mean? When you talk about redemption, what does redemption mean? It means to buy, right? To buy, to purchase, to exchange. Then we can be redeemed. We can be exchanged. What Jesus Christ bought us. Right? And, and, and don't have to get into that deep of a, an explanation to help them understand salvation is a part in a restoration, deliverance. Asking Jesus to come into your life. Do you realize in this world that we're living in today that there are some people, if you tell them out on the street and they've never heard it, that you can ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, it kind of looks, it sounds kind of weird to them. How can 
and we tell them that in a language they can understand. Atonement, what does atonement mean? Payment, restitution, satisfaction, atonement. Jesus Christ died so you wouldn't have to die in your sins. Justification, meaning that no matter how bad you were or what you've done, that there is mercy, there is forgiveness. And some people do not like to use the word uh, like this, but I heard a pastor say this many years ago, justification, just if I never sinned. And when I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, God looks at me as though I have never sinned. I've never done anything wrong. I've never displeased God before because God sees me through what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And that's a whole lot of stuff there to think about. But how are we going to tell them? So the next thing, and I'm moving quickly. It's so complicated. Andrew said, come see the Messiah. We, we found the Messiah. But look at the, the verse 45. Philip is going to go evangelize as well. I want you to look at how Philip does it. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him who Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Do what? Andrew said, We found the Messiah. Philip says, we found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Immediately, Nathaniel becomes skeptical. And do you know where his mind goes? Instead of Jesus, the Messiah, it goes to Nazareth. Look at the scripture again with me. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And his mind goes to Nazareth. And he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We're not talking about that. We're not talking about how bad Nazareth is. We're not talking about all those things. What we're talking about is we found Jesus. But how many people today would rather sit and argue with an unbeliever about how real Jesus is. Right? So what we tend to do is get so wrapped up in Christian apologetics and trying to explain to a sinner, an unbeliever, all the things we know. What does apologetics mean? And, and this is what I want you to understand. When we talk about apologetics, it doesn't mean apologizing. Okay? That's not Christian apologetics. Christian apologetics is where it is a, a, a study and effort to where we defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? We defend the faith. So when you hear somebody talking about Christian apologetics, it's not Christians apologizing. It's Christians defending the faith. So understand that. But Christian apologetics are not to be brought to the simple invitation of saying, hey, we found the Messiah. Come and see. But a lot of people want to get there and argue with the people who do not know Jesus Christ. And they're probably never going to know him if all we do is give them everything we know about why did God created the earth and why we didn't come from monkeys and why the earth was destroyed by the flood and, and why all of these things. Just tell them we found Jesus. We found Jesus and what he's done in our life. Come and see. Robbie Kesselman said, we want to discuss the age of the earth, the ten reasons why we know the tomb was empty. We want to make a case for God instead of just inviting hungry people to taste the bread of life. Just come and see. Come and see. What happens? Today, people are expecting to be lied to. Political ads? Don't nobody believe them. I don't. I don't believe any political ads. All kind of races, all kind of tales. Commercials promising happiness. You buy this car, 
that had it going on. Um, it's a thing that was in chat. Medicines, medications, vitamins, all you need is this one pill in your life will change forever. People expect to be lied to because they know that most of that stuff is just. My, my dad used to say that in those cereal commercials about breakfast cereal that there was more there were more vitamins in the box than was actually in the cereal. <laughs> Today, it is often grace that leads people to the truth. We serve a Savior and bring people well when we remember that. People today seldom ask true questions. They're on a quest for meaning, something deeper. They've been lied to everywhere they turn. They want meaning. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of my existence? Why am I here? Be responsive today to the hunger, the lives of those that invite them to come and see Jesus. Close up, personal, in your own faith story. Keep the person and work of Jesus Christ central. Witness the power of God that brings salvation. I love the story. I've, I've mentioned it so many times, but I love the story of the woman of the well. She had left the town where she had a bad name, a bad reputation. She had left that town and went to the well, and there at the well she met Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. She turned and ran back into that town of where her reputation was worst in dirt. And she said to them, Come and see a man that stole me everything. Can this be the Christ? I read this week that this woman who had been married so many times and was shacking up with the man she was living with became the first evangelist to the Samaritans. You know what? Let me ask you this, church folks. When Jesus was at the well and the woman came up there to draw water and she accepted the water of life and her life began to change, where were the disciples? The Bible says they'd gone into town to buy food. So you tell me you got 12 preachers in the making down there in the city? And not one of them is making an impression at all. You know why they got food on their mind? But there's one lady with a mighty bad reputation that only spends a little time with the Jesus that all of those disciples have been hanging around with for months. And she runs and tells the people, not knowing if they're going to listen or not, because they know her. She says, come see a man that's told me everything. Can this be the Christ? The town jumps in behind her, behind her, and runs. You know what they said after they hear Jesus? They said to begin with, we believe because of what you said. But now that we've been here, we've heard for ourselves, and we believe for ourselves. What I'm wondering today, we're about to sing that 
song again. On one day we're going to worship the Lord and talk about singing, worshiping Him around the throne. Our focus needs to be on those that's not ready to go there. And it's our job as ambassadors, as believers, as sinners whose lives have been transformed. It's our job now. To help add to that number every nation try to come. <coughs> I wonder if we can leave here today and say, let me tell you about a man who's told me about all that I've done and forgiven me for all that I've done. This is the Christ. Do you know someone today who needs Jesus? Do you know someone today who needs hope? Will you stand with me, please? <coughs> Would you bow your heads with me and just be in the spirit of prayer? And I want to talk to you this morning and perhaps you've not given your life completely to Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you, Jesus Christ is knocking on your door this morning. It was not by have a chance that you just came today. You know what? You may say, but I, I have signed a membership card. I joined the church many years ago, or maybe up until the day, the time, all that. But, but I'm talking about transformation in your life. I'm talking about the change that he brings. Why don't you this morning... Stick around him long enough to, like the woman at the well did, to where you find out who this man is. Why don't you just say right now, Lord, I've gone through the motions. A lot of people have thought that I was saved. But I want you to transform me. I want you to change my life. I know what it is. church. I know what it is to stand on the platform. I know what it is to be a leader in the church and not be transformed. I know what it's like to profess Christianity but not know the joy of salvation. I know what it's like to talk about it and to preach about it, but not know the power of deliverance. It's not about me. It's about 
of Jesus and surrendering your life to Jesus. We're not talking about fire insurance to keep us out of hell. We're not talking about just a ticket to catch the flight out. We're talking about a life transformation. And I'm going to tell you something. There's some of you this morning here that does not know what I'm talking about. But all I'm going to say to you is come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Jesus is calling you today. Jesus is calling you this morning. All Andrew said was, come and see. We found the Messiah. We follow Peter, the one that Andrew was talking to. A little while later, Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He knew beyond the shadow of a doubt. You know, uh, Peter has some rocky times, but Acts chapter 2, we find them standing, telling the whole town the salvation. Thousands of people give their life to God, but it all started with Andrew. Who just simply said, come and see. You see, his life was completely transformed. God's wanting to do that for you this morning. I want the worship team to sing. The altar is open. The Holy Spirit is calling you, and I am asking you this morning myself to come and see. Balls in your court. Why do you come? The altar's open. There's nothing, nothing, no time like the present.